Hello and welcome back to the channel. As always, I'm your host, Morgan. So I'm sure that many of you have probably heard about John Muir and how he contributed to the preservation and establishment of Yosemite National Park. Well, today let's talk a little bit about the story of how Grand Teton National Park actually became Grand Teton National Park. Before we dive into this, um, I'm going to say the words Jackson Hole a lot, and Jackson Hole kind of refers to the valley there by the Teton Range. The Tetons are the mountains there. So just want to make sure that's cleared up right here at the beginning. And also, if you want some more nature educationally content, please consider subscribing and possibly even giving me a like. All right, let's dive into this now. Now, Grand Teton National Park and the areas surrounding it actually has prehistoric beginnings with its relationship with mankind. About 11,000 years ago, the first humans were able to enter the Jackson Hole area and the Teton Range when the Pleistocene Age glaciers retreated. This is a pretty common tale with other mountainous areas with valleys like that in North America. This is also similar to Yosemite National Park, where a lot of the landscape there was carved by glaciers. The valleys and the mountains here, glacial activity helped carve them as well. And so once those glaciers retreated, people were able to take advantage of the land that was uncovered, and not just people, the wildlife as well. And ever since that time, Native Americans have been taking advantage of the summers where resources are quite abundant in the area and retreating along with the herds that they followed for hunting and all that fun stuff in the winter because the winters in that area are very harsh. So summers are a time of plenty and then winters are follow the herds and find somewhere to escape the harsh weather. Specifically Shoshone, Blackfoot, Bannock, Crow, Flathead, Gross, Venture, Nez Pierce, and many more tribes of Native Americans were quite established when the first European explorers set foot into the area that would soon become the National Park. Let's start with John Coulter. So John Coulter was possibly the first person of European descent to ever enter Jackson Hole. He was originally part of the Lewis and Clark expedition, but he left in the fall of 1806. He traveled in the Grand Teton area in the winter of 1807-1808. However, he left no written record of his journey, so this is where his story ends for us, and a lot of what is known is fuzzy at best. After that, the area became popular with fur trappers or mountain men because in the early 1800s, fur-topped hats were quite fashionable and the Grand Teton area has quite a few beavers that they just wanted to turn into hats. Now, since this whole Grand Teton area is part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, we know that there are all these fun rivers and stuff and the beavers and the beaver ponds are a big part of the ecosystem. So there were a lot of beavers there and fur trappers flocked to Jackson Hole and a lot of them based their operations in the area, which meant the beaver population actually rapidly declined. And then fashion trends favored silk hats after that as fur became more expensive and all that stuff. And fashion is fickle, fashion trends change all the time. So by the 1840s, the mountain man era had essentially faded from the area. But then that leads us to America's westward expansion and the expeditions that traveled the area because of that. Now, these expeditions were mapping the landscape, they were documenting natural resources, and they were searching for new areas to lay the foundations for railroad access because at that time, railroads were the hot thing to get goods from point A to point B, and people as well. There were three notable expeditions that did a lot of this work, 
and greatly expanded our knowledge of the Teton Range, especially at that time. One was under the command of Captain W.F. Reynolds in 1860, another Ferdinand V. Hayden in 1872, and then Gustavus C. Doan in 1876. We're not going to go into the specifics of all those expeditions because it would take way too much time, but those are three notable ones that if you want to learn more about them, have at it. So that brings us to homesteaders. So the Homestead Act of 1862 encouraged people to move westward, but homesteaders didn't actually come to Jackson Hill until 1884. So that is quite some time. And they weren't exactly met with the most favorable conditions, despite these summers of bounty that were taken advantage of by Native Americans and despite the prosperity that fur trappers had in the area. So what were they met with? Well, there was a lot of rocky, sandy soil and these long, cold winters and very dry summers. So not exactly the best conditions for setting up a little farm and establishing a life. However, there are a couple of homesteads that we're going to talk about that helped shape the area. The first one is known as Mormon Row. And it was originally named Grovant by the U.S. Post Office. But if you're going to be looking it up, it goes... It's under the name Mormon Row now, and if you go to the Grand Teton website, it's under the name Mormon Row. So it was established in 1890 by a party sent by the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Mormon Church for those of us that are not offended by saying Mormon Church, from Salt Lake Valley. At this time, remember that the Mormon Church had gotten pushed into Utah and the Salt Lake area. So they were looking for other areas to establish, and this was one of the areas that they sent a party. There were 27 homesteads in the Grovant area with relatively fertile soil, which is surprising because remember the soil conditions that most homesteaders were met with was this kind of rocky, sandy stuff that one wouldn't think is great for planting. And this particular area was lucky because it had protection from the wind by the Blacktail Butte, and it had access to the Grosventure River, meaning that they had a steady supply of water and they had kind of a windbreak that helped protect them from winter storms and other storms as well. Plus that fertile soil, they got very lucky. And so they were able to be fairly prosperous and grow crops with the help of irrigation. And this took place from the years of 1893 to 1937. So they were there for quite a while. Now, Mormon Row is a protected historical site. And if you do visit Grand Teton National Park, you can visit quite a few of the little homesteads that were in this particular location. And they have been preserved for historical purposes. Now, this brings us to Menor's Ferry District. And this is a little bit more of an interesting one because it's not just setting up a farm and subsisting. So in 1892, Bill Menor traveled from Ohio to Montana and settled on the Snake River. And he ended up settling in one of the very few locations where the Snake River can be crossed because the Snake River is kind of a bunch of channels through much of the area and it's not a very easy thing to cross. So he picked a location that was perfect for him to establish his ferry, a general store, smokehouse, blacksmith, and transportation barn. So very quickly, his little operation became a hub for anyone traveling through the area. And he provided produce to the local dude ranches. We'll get 
into the dude ranches in just a second. And again, since he was a hub for anyone traveling through the area, you could find anyone from mountain men to travelers to these rich people going to stay at the dude ranches, stopping at his little hub, especially since he had a ferry and was one of the only ways to safely get across the Snake River. Now in 1915, Maud Noble ended up visiting the Menor homestead because his little setup was still technically a homestead, though it wasn't a farm really or anything like that in the more traditional sense. <clears throat> And she was just looking for adventure. And she kind of fell in love with the whole area. So in 1918, she bought the ferry from Menor and moved her cabin to the homestead from its original location on Cottonwood Creek. And notably on July 26, 1923, Maud Noble hosted a big meeting with the Yellowstone National Park Superintendent, Horace Albright and some businessmen to plant the first seeds of what would become Grand Teton National Park. But we'll get into that in a second. And there are other notable homesteads, but these are just the two that I picked to talk about in this video. The National Park website has much more information on the other ones as well, if you're interested. So let's talk about the dude ranches I mentioned a few minutes ago. Since Homesteaders kind of had it pretty tough in the area. It wasn't that great for farming. And if you didn't get lucky and get in one of the couple good areas to make a profit, like Menor and like the people of Mormon Row, you kind of had to improvise. And so that's why homesteaders started setting up what became known as dude ranches. And what dude ranches did was they basically hosted these wealthy people from the east that wanted to visit the area and get a cowboy experience. So the men would be known as dudes, the women would be known as dudens, and they paid for their lodging, food, a horse, and any other outdoor activities that the facility was going to offer to them. And this was quite profitable for them and the golden age of dude ranching was in the 1920s when those wealthy Easterners wanted to escape out and get into the wilderness for a bit and rough it. And since all of this was occurring, development began to happen in the Grand Teton area. It was becoming a place where these wealthy Easterners wanted to vacation. So in the 1920s, with the tourism increasing, so did the development. Which brings us to that meeting we talked about very recently, that meeting in 1923 at Maud Noble's cabin. And this was that first step in the conservation of the mountains and the valley. So in 1926, John D. Rockefeller Jr., you know, of the standard oil Rockefellers, toured the area with Horace Albright and absolutely fell in love with the area. And at this moment, you're probably thinking, oh, so oil drilling. But no, he fell in love with the area and he wanted it protected. So he spent the next two decades purchasing 35,000 acres of land through the Snake River Land Company with the intention to donate that land to become part of Grand Teton National Park. He had no intentions of searching for oil or anything. He just wanted to protect the area. And this was actually quite controversial amongst the locals that were not exactly trusting of donating the land to the government. That seemed like a bad idea to them. Despite the controversy, in 1929, Congress established the first national park that included the Teton Range and a couple of the lakes at the base of the mountains. But at this time, the only thing that was federally protected was the mountain range and those specific lakes. So in 1943, FDR declared the valley, so the Jackson Hole Valley, 
to be a national monument, creating Jackson Hole National Monument. At this time, both of the areas were protected, so the Teton Range and the lakes and the valley, they just were not part of the same thing yet, but they were protected. Fast forward a few years to 1949, John D. Rockefeller Jr. donated all of the land that he'd been buying up to be added to the National Park. And then the following year in 1950, the National Park and the National Monument were combined, creating the Grand Teton National Park in about what it is today. And then in 1972, Congress established the John D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway, which actually connects um, Yellowstone and Grand Teton. And that parkway also has protected land around it as well. So that is pretty much the tale that brings us to Grand Teton National Park, what it is today. There's so much more fascinating history behind this. What I find a little bit the most fascinating is that someone from this big old money oil company family looked at all of this beautiful mountain range, beautiful valley, and just didn't want to destroy it. His instinct was, I need to buy this land to protect it. And honestly, that gives me a little hope for humanity, even though that is not what we see in this day and age. But I don't want to be a downer here. I do really suggest that if you are into history, please head over to the Grand Teton website. I have uh, the link to specifically their history page linked down below and shovel through that because you can easily spend hours on it. They've got some really cool old photos of all of the places that we've talked about today and more. And what I'm going to be using while I'm in the park is the Grand Teton app so that we can do self-guided history and nature tours as well. My partner's really into history, so we're probably going to spend a day driving around to the historical sites. And I do hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, afternoon, evening, what have you. Don't forget to like, comment. If you have anything that you would like to share down in the comment section below, please keep the conversation going. And even consider subscribing if you feel so inclined. I will see you all in the next one. Thank you again for watching this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell if you would like to see more. And if you'd like to follow me on any of my other social medias, the links are down in the description below. Don't forget to check out thereptilegoth.com for all of my articles and blog posts. If you found any value in this video and you would like to help support the channel, please check out my Patreon page. That link is also in the description down below. And a special thanks goes out to my Diamond Dragon patron, Diane V. What you're doing is really helping me fund a dream here. I will see you guys all in the next one.